Recording in progress.
Hey, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Good. Oh, isn't this rain great? How much have we got so far? A little bit here. Everything's wet outside. My rain gauge. I don't know why it reset. It's weird. It's supposed to be set every 24 hours. So we have 0 0.06 inches. Oh, uh, I've got ambitious plans for today. All right. Well, before we do that, how is your current program going? Well, you, you got it done last week. I Well, I did one. I only wrote it with one way. I, I plan on doing more, but I just, I didn't have time. All right. Um, but I wrote it. I, I tried to figure out how to bring the hashes in mm -hmm. and store those, but uh, it, it didn't happen. Uh, we'll give you so, a big but, hint today. All right. Um, yeah, I tried to malloc those in, and then I tried to pass that to the um, function that was hashing them, that was cracking the hashes, mm -hmm. and uh, it didn't work. But. I got it. I mean, it's super crazy fast now. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, what I've got here is my son's um, Pokemon card folder. He's he's only he's only eight. He doesn't actually play the game. He just collects the cards. That's cool. Uh, so what do we got in here? What's your favorite Pokemon? Pikachu. Pikachu, of course. I don't know. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, I got it. There we go. Yeah. Pikachu? Does he have an Alakazam? Oh, well, they're not in any particular order, at least not that I can tell. So I would have to do a linear search to find the one that I'm looking for. <laughs> To start from the beginning. He's like a psychic Pokemon with spoons. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what are some of the attributes of a Pokemon? Well, obviously, there's the there's the name of the Pokemon. Right? And there's the hit points. What else is on here? I don't even know how to read these things. I'm not sure. So there's <laughs> actions that each yeah. Pokemon can do that will, um, you know, apply something to their opponent. Yeah. Isn't there like um, a type of Pokemon? Like yeah, I think there's... Yeah. Sorry? It's like electric and water and... Yeah. Water plant. and air and... and yeah. Do you know what all the types are? Is the type this little... Is that this, this little... Uh, Icon is in the corner. Yeah, I yeah, I think so. Yeah. I don't know what they mean because one looks like a, I mean, obviously an electric bolt, right? I got that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then one looks like a fist. What is that? Uh, I think that's Earth. Earth, and then yeah. there's there's the leaf. Yeah, plant. And there's yeah. an eye. Eye is probably psychic. And there's fire. I had hundreds of Pokemon cards growing up. <laughs> what well, he's got hundreds here. Okay, well let's let's try to write some of this down. So we've got the name. It. We've got the hit points, we have the type, and the type uh, could be like, uh, what, air, water, plant. Am, am, I, am I right? 
Uh, let me, let let me look Mark, this up. Are we just too old look. for this? <laughs> no, no, not. Never too old to learn. <laughs> I don't think that is a type. Grass. Grass? Oh, is it okay. grass? One, one, two, three, six times three. It looks like there's 18 different oh. types. I thought there was only like four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Flying, water, grass, fire, ice, ground, rock, dragon, steel, fairy, psychic. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I stopped playing those games before like the last couple came out. Uh, god. There's a lot. There's like 12 or 13 in the original, um, the original game <laughs> back in the early <laughs> 90s. <laughs> um. Well then, so if we were to make uh, a struct to contain this mm -hmm. information, what would that look like? Destruct Pokemon, and then to hold information about the name, it would be char name, and then we just need enough characters to hold like the longest name in here. Which is probably like maybe twenty. I mean, they're all pretty short. They're all like they're all like eight or nine characters, right? And then we have the hit points. Mm -hmm. And then we have the type. Also pretty short, maybe just uh, ten characters or so. We'd have uh, the four stat, like attack. Oh, I know. There's, there's like there's a zillion things we can put on here. I just wanted to keep <laughs> something relatively simple, right? So we got this struct that holds uh, some in, in the name of the Pikachu or the name of the the Pokemon, <laughs> the hit points and the and the type, right? They're all Pikachu. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's let's start typing some of these up. Cool. So of course we got Pikachu, um, who according to this card has 60 hit points, and the type is electric? Yeah. I better put these right back in the same slot, <laughs> otherwise he's going <laughs> to Who moved my Pikachu? Oh, let's just pick some others at random here. What are your favorite ones? My brother scams me out of my holographic Alakazam, so ever <laughs> since then I've, I've always wanted to have one. <laughs> so that's my favorite. My daughter likes Charizard. Charizard? Charizard? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with a D. Um, how many hit points would an Alakazam be? He's terrible. Like, honestly. <laughs> I just like him. 30. And um, what, what type of uh, Pokemon is he? Psychic. Yeah, he's psychic. And Charizard? He's fire. He's got a lot of hit points. Probably 60. He's big. Let's do a few more. Yeah. Misty's horsey. 40 hit points. Um, water? Not watcher. Come on. I know, I just got the same thing. <laughs> 
Cinder Quill. 40. And this one is Psychic, I guess, because it got an eye. And we'll do one more. Rock rough. 60 hit points. Earth. You know, this would be another project for another time. The Pokemon name generator. <laughs> I don't know who comes up with these things, but they're pretty cool. I mean, like, they're like little puns, right? Mm -hmm. All right, that's, that's enough of that. So my ambitious plans for today are we've got this, we got this file with the seven Pokemon in it. We want to read this file into an array of uh, Pokemon structs. And then we want to do things like be able to search so that we could type in the name of a Pokemon and it will show us information about it. Do you think we can do this? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. So let's start, let's start building this program. So this is my uh, Pokédex, right? <laughs> Let's start by defining the struct. And I'm going to show you a few things that are new here. One is, when you define a struct, the, you're defining essentially a new type. And the type is called struct, in this case, struct Pokemon. So it's two words. But it gets kind of um, laborious after a time to type both those words. So you can create an alias of a type and give it a new name. And the way you do that is, is, the, is the keyword type def and then you give it the original name, and then you give it the new name. And you can do this for any type. Um, like I can go int and then meters. <laughs> and that creates basically an alias for integers called meters. And so now I can do like meters length. And I create a variable called length, whose type is meters, but behind the scenes it's just an int. That's cool. So it's really uh, just creating an alias, right? You take an existing type and you give it a new name. It doesn't replace the existing type, you can still use integers, but now you've got one uh, where you can be a little more descriptive about what that thing actually is. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to say type def struct Pokemon and then give it a shorter name. And the name actually could be Pokemon. Okay, so now anytime we type Pokemon, it actually means struct Pokemon. Cool. Okay, so we're now going to write a program to read these Pokemon into an array, and then, um, well, I guess the first thing to do is let's, let's get that file opened up, and let's just start reading in the, the various entries and see if we can do that. So go int main, int argc, character pointer argv, this is the usual stuff here. And we're just going to get the name of the file off of the command line. 
Hold on a sec here. Okay, so let's do our usual check. If arg c is less than two, that means we don't have any command line arguments. All right, and now we'll get our file opened. Open it for reading, and then check to make sure we actually got it opened. So, so far, this is all pretty standard stuff. Why doesn't the p error null work with the um, the first f print error? Because I it was I was throwing errors writing last night and like why um, is this the p problem? error only accepts a single string? Like, I can't I can't do this um, variable substitution in p error like I can with printf. Right, but if if I had put p error null below as I did below the F printf on mm -hmm. line 16, right? So it goes in between right there. It was giving me an error, and then when I commented it out, it worked just fine. You were doing p error null there? Yep. Um, that could be because it was when you compiled it gave you an error, when you ran it, it gave you an error. It was when I was compiling. And I didn't understand why. Mm, I don't know. It shouldn't give you an error. Uh, well, I guess. Should we find out? Yeah, maybe I just did it wrong. Oh, I need to include standard library. So it should compile. Now it won't it won't really do anything because hmm. P error depends upon uh, one of the operating system variables behind the scenes to be set to indicate what went wrong. In this case, there's no operating system call that went wrong. We, did, we didn't fail to open a file. We didn't fail to receive packets I on see. the network. You know, it, it's just a, a usage error. So okay. there's no reason to use p error here. Okay. In this case, we did try to do a file a operating system function f open. Yeah. And then that would set that variable, the status variable. I wonder why it was doing that. I must have written it wrong. I just didn't see. Someone asked here, can we use the struct name after... You know, you can actually combine the struct into one thing here. You do it like this. Um... And so that now defines the struct and gives it its alias all in one. Okay. And in this case also, since you don't need the, the name of the struct, right? You don't, have to, you don't have to call it struct Pokemon. You're just immediately going to give it a new name anyway. You can leave this off. So now you don't have anything called struct Pokemon at all. You only have Pokemon whose type is the structure. All right, so little, a couple of little shortcuts you can do in C. Okay, so we got the file open, and now let's start reading it in. Um, we're going to use our standard uh, while. And, and here's what I'm going to suggest you do. We're going to read in each one of the lines using f get s. We're going to put it into a long string, and then we're going to use uh, s scanf to break apart the line into its individual pieces.
Okay, so let's make a Pokemon. Let's call, actually, I'm going to rename this file up here. I'm going to call this um, PF for Pokemon file. <laughs> right. Just so that I can have a variable called P whose type is Pokemon. <laughs> um, so I'm going to use scanf, and then uh, inside each one of these lines, I have a string, a number, and a string. So if I go percent %s, comma, percent %d, comma, percent %s, and I'm getting that out of the line, and then I'm going to put, put one of these pieces into that struct. So I go p.name, p.hitpoints, and p.type except that the hit points is an integer, so I need to put the ampersand in front. The name and the type are both strings, and those are pointers, so I don't have to put the ampersand in front. So I, I could conceivably use f scan f to pull each one of these variables out of the line in my loop rather than using f get s. Um, I kind of prefer this method here of reading it into a single line and then breaking it apart using s scan f for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is if there is an error on one of these lines, you're not going to mess up the whole loop. The problem with scanf here is that as soon as it reads a character that doesn't match the pattern, it just stops. And then the next time you call scanf, it picks up where it left off. Well, if you got an error, let's say in one of these lines over here, let's say someone forgot to put a comma there, then um, scanf here is going to get to the end of this line and go, okay, I need the next, uh, the next word there, and it's going to sit there and wait. And it kind of breaks the loop. And really what you want to do is just read that line in. If there's an error on the line, uh, like don't process the line, or, or maybe you might get an error on that one line, but at least you're then able to proceed and go to the next line and get the rest of the data in. Okay, now let's see if at least that worked. Right, so we, we read the line in, we broke it apart into the name, the hit points, and the type, and now let's just print the values out, and then let's see if at least we got this far. So a couple of printfs. Uh, we'll just do uh, hit points, percent %d, and then type percent %s. And let's see if we got things going. Oh, and it's finally we'll uh, f close the Pokemon file. Oops. There we go. Oh, I need to give it the name of the file. <laughs> not not the C file. Uh, what's it called? Pokemon.txt. Oh, nothing happened. Huh. Um, so what happened there? We got nothing. Oh, you know what? <laughs> I forgot to save this file. <laughs> Right there, see that, see that circle? <laughs> I didn't save it. Save. Okay. All right, well, we got something. It doesn't quite look right, but we got something. <clears throat> what went wrong here? It looked like everything got put into name and nothing appeared for hit points and nothing appeared for the type.
Because you need the pointer in the printf, right? Where? Here? Not yeah. at all. Not at all. No. No? No. Because while F gets, it was running the whole thing and then stuffing it into the first one. No. I mean, we, we got one, two, three, four, five, six. We got seven. Printfs, each one, each one a separate Pokemon. Right, so but doesn't F gets go through until the new line character? Yeah. And so at the end of each one, it's a new line character, and then it stops, and then it stuffs that into the. So, so it's there's a well, problem with the delimiter, right? Where here? Or here? Uh, when F gets is using it. So we want F get us to read in the whole line. We want F get us to get it to pull this entire thing in into this variable called line, mm -hmm. and then have S scanf break that line up into the name, the hit points, and the type. Right, and it's... In the text file, you don't have a space in between the commas, because everything is one long string. It looks like it's just all split together. So wouldn't it be comma, space, 60, comma, no, space, my, electric? My pattern here contains the comma. Okay. So I read in a string, and, and then a comma, and then a number, and then a comma, and then a string. Without, without a space in between. Yeah. So this is a really subtle problem. Well, for whatever reason, it's, it's not separating them at the comma. So yeah. that we have to state somehow to separate it at the comma. I just don't know how. Yeah. Anyone on YouTube know what's going on? A really subtle problem with the way uh, scanf is working. It kind of looks like it's can... printing the whole line rather than splitting it up. Yeah, it's not splitting it up. Everything's going into name, and nothing's going into hit points or type. So, so like w when we have this percent s here, everything went into here, and nothing went into here or here. All right, so here's what's going on. Percent %s means read in a string, right? And a string is basically any characters, and it reads it up to the, um, the first space. In fact, you can see there's a little problem here. Remember, Misty's seahorse was two words, and it stopped at Misty's. Can you change that to a comma? Well, that's kind of like what we need to do here. The problem is, is that a comma, the comma in between Pikachu and 60 is part of a string. Oh, so if we in just fact, insert fact, a few all of backslash this is a string. Over. All of this is a string. So scanf here doesn't stop when it hits the first comma. It stops when it hits the end of the string. And all those characters on the entire line are a valid string. So... Scanf here is not breaking it apart because it's not looking for a comma. It's looking for so a space. Can, can, so do we have to put our null characters in there? No. What we can do is we can, we can use a different um, pattern matcher here. So there's a different way to, to express, I want to read in a string, but we can tell it what characters we want to use as a string. By default, it just uses any characters. You do it with what, regex? Kind of like a regex, yeah. It's, it's, it's not a full regular expression. It's a very limited form. But mm -hmm. uh, you use the, the square brackets, and in here you put a, a caret and a comma. And so this means read in all characters that aren't commas. This caret here means not. So read in all characters that are not commas into the name. And then when it hits the comma, it'll stop and move on. Do we have to, to set the type or anything? Hmm? Say that again? Do we have to set the, the type or is it just automatically a character? It's when automatically it's a string. This is just a different way to express strings. Okay. And so, so we'll read in all characters that are not commas. Then we'll read in a comma. Then we'll read in an integer. Then a comma. And then we'll do the same thing here. All characters that are not a comma. Actually, in this case, we can just use percent %s because we're going to the end of the line anyway. 
Nice. So I had said oh, it looks like it was bringing in a whole string. If we had just put a space after each comma, would it would it have worked that way? It would have read Instead the comma of... in as part of the string. Ah. Wow. All right. So this is better. Mm -hmm. So now it's split it apart, and and we got Misty Seahorse or Horsey. We got the whole thing. Right, because now we told it stop at the comma. Even if you encounter a space, it'll keep going. That's cool. So, this is kind of like how you would deal with a what's called a CSV or a comma separated value file. Is uh, since you're using a comma as a delimiter, you can't just naively use percent %s because commas are part of strings. So we need to use a different form to say I want to read in everything that's not a comma and then move on to the next, the next thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so just to recap, we've got a struct that holds the three characteristics of a Pokemon and then we've given it a short name to begin with. Right? We use type def to alias this struct, and now it's, a, it's an anonymous struct because we didn't give the struct itself a name, and then we alias this entire anonymous struct as Pokemon. So in our program, we don't have to say struct Pokemon, we can just say Pokemon. So where is the struct stored in memory? Is it the same place as a malloc? Does it malloc it out? Um, like here? Well, when you build the struct and you put it in there. Oh, up here, it's just, it's just a definition. It's not stored anywhere. Oh, okay. It's just a declaration that says, here's what a struct looks like. Gotcha. Kind of like um, a, a template. Mm -hmm. I thought behind the scenes maybe it was storing it. No. No, but when I actually find ways declare the variable, and... when I actually make <laughs> the variable, in this case called P, then it sets aside the memory. And where does it set it aside at? Uh, this is a local variable, so it's on the stack. Okay. All right, so now that we know that we can read each one of the Pokemon uh, data into a struct, we can start with our more ambitious project, which is now an array. So there's, there's two ways we can build this array. One is we can do, this is I think the one we'll do first, is we got this array and each one of the elements of the array is one of those structs. And the other way we could build the array is with pointers to structs. Sorry, it's really small writing here, but each one of these small boxes is a struct. There's pros and cons to both, but let's do it this first way first. Let's do it this way. Okay, so how do we declare, how do we declare this array? So this is an array of what? Is a Pokemon. Mm -hmm. We'll call it Pokédex. And in this particular picture, picture it holds four of them. So this is an array 
of four Pokemons. And each Pokemon is a struct. And for this one at the bottom, this is an array of Pokemon pointers. Okay, so this is an array of five Pokemon pointers. Each one of these is going to point to a Pokemon. And then these will all be malloced separately. All right, so but let's do it, let's do this one first. All right, so uh, we still got our line, but now let's make an array, Pokemon. Pokedex. And I know I've got seven Pokemon in there, so let's just make one that's like big enough, 10. And then I need a, like a, a counter, right? Okay, so um, I'm going to read in a single line out of the file. Um, in this case, I don't need this. And then I'm going to break it apart. But here I'm going to use Pokedex bracket count. Pokedex count and Pokedex count. Okay, you see what I'm doing here? Is I've yeah, got you're... I've got this counter that's that's counting through the array. And you're telling it what element in the array you're going to add it to. And then I just need to remember to increment count. Right. Okay. And so we're going to close the file. Oh, let's not let's not print Do anything we... out. I'm not going to print anything out until we've got all of it read in. Then we're going to close the file and now we're just going to run a little loop. For int i equals 0, i is less than count i plus plus. And now we're going to print out each one of those. Go percent %s, percent %d, percent %s. This is very quickly, right? We'll just print out each one of the three things. And then we go uh, pokedex, bracket i, dot, whoops, dot name, pokedex, bracket i, dot hit points, and pokedex, bracket i, dot type. And we got them. So uh, each one of these, and it, just, to, just to be sure, let's put percent %d here, and let's also print out the value of i to show that we're actually going through the array. 
So the zeroth element is our Pikachu. Number one element is our Grubbin. Number two is Alakazam, and so forth. Are we good so far? Okay, so let's yeah, recap just... there. So <clears throat> we created an array of 10 Pokemon along with a counter to keep track of where in the array we are as we, as we um, fill the array up. The F get S is still the same. Our S scanf has been modified to not read it into a single struct, but to read it into each one of the structs that are in the array. So as we go down the array, we're incrementing count, and so we're putting the name, hit points, and type into each one of the elements of the array. So if you look back at this picture over here, uh, we read in one single line, and then we fill in um, element number zero, and then we increment to the next one, and then we fill in the next one, and then we fill in the next one, and then we fill in the next one, and so forth. Okay, then we increment count, and go back and do that as long as there's still lines in the file. Close the file, and then just simply run a loop to print out each one of the elements of the array. Oh, Lawrence on YouTube says he's here because of the Make Files video. <laughs> Everyone's here because <laughs> of the Make Files video. <laughs> That's like my, one of my single most watched videos. I wish it was shorter, though. It's like, it's like 50 minutes long, right? But I guess I needed that much time to really walk through all the steps. Okay, so, so we got everything read into an array, and... Now we can do something like search. So we could prompt the user to type in the name of a Pokemon, and then we'll search that array looking for that Pokemon. Now, since the array is not in any particular order, we just have to do a linear search. Start from the beginning, go towards the end. So let's prompt the user. I'm going to use fgetS so I get the name of entire, an entire Pokemon. If I use uh, scanf, then it's going to stop at the first space, and I don't want to do that. And uh, Ocean Coding says, if my file contains more than 10 lines, my program will crash. And that's correct. We're going to fix that. Okay, so we prompt, we used fgetS to read in the name of a Pokemon. We need to strip off the new line character. This is our standard uh, use string character to find that and pull it off. We're actually not really pulling it off. We're just replacing it with an old character. And now we need to run a loop that goes from zero to the count and then checks each one of those structs that it finds if that's the name of the Pokemon that we're looking for. Why isn't this 10? Why are we using count instead of 10? Because 10 is the size of our array. Why aren't we using 10? So that we can change it. No. Oh, because 10, you're going to, there's, it's not totally full. Yeah. And you're going to find things that aren't actually there. Right, exactly. So 10 is the total size of the array, 
but our file only has seven. So count is going to contain how many we actually read in, not the total size of the array. Okay, so we're going to go from zero to the count, and then we need to do a search. So um, string compare. Sure. So if string compare, target, and pokedex i dot name is equal to zero, then we found it. Uh, I'm getting really tired of typing this in. This is like the third time I've typed in something to print out a Pokemon. Um, I'm really tempted to write a function for that. Okay, need to include string.h. All right, we'll zip up there and we'll do that. Okay, enter the name of Pokemon to find. We'll do Charizard. And I found it. And we'll do one that's not in there, like uh, Onyx. And it didn't print anything. So I, I guess that's good. All right, now like I said, there's a couple places where I print out a Pokemon. So let's make a function. This, uh, this function is going to take a Pokemon as input and then just print it out. Actually, I think I'll print it out without the new line character on there. And then over here, where I want to print out the Pokemon, I just call print Pokemon, and I'll pass in my Pokedex Ith Pokemon, and then let me just print out my new line character. All right. Oh, and I need to put I here. That simplifies things a little bit. I can do the same thing down here. Found. And let's just make sure that worked. Okay, no, no compilation errors. Looks good. Well, that wasn't bad for 50 minutes of work. <laughs> Has it already been that long? Holy smokes. That went by fast. So, so let's see. So what did we do? I <laughs> always like doing these little recaps here, right? So um, 
I made a struct that holds information about a Pokemon. I made a function called print Pokemon that prints out information about that. You pass it in one of those structs, and then it just prints out the various fields. Um, I open a file for reading, and this file looks like this, where it's got the name of a Pokemon, the number of hit points, and the type of the Pokemon, separated by commas. So this is a comma-separated values file, or CSV file. Create an array that holds up to 10 Pokemon. And this is going to be a problem if we had more than 10, but we'll fix that. And then we use fgets to read in an entire line of the, from the file, so all three values in one string. And then we use sscanf to break it apart into the individual pieces. As we break it apart, we're inserting each one of the uh, information about the Pokemon into this array. So we're using count to index into the array. Pokedex bracket count refers to a single Pokemon, and then we can use dot name and dot HP and dot type to access the individual fields of that struct. Can I see your print Pokemon sure. function again? It's up here. So the print oh, Pokemon okay. takes in a single Pokemon as a parameter and then prints out the fields. That's cool. So you can pass in structs just like you pass in integers and doubles. It's like passing an object in Java. Mm -hmm. Except that in Java, when you pass in an object, what you're really just passing in is a pointer to the object. Mm -hmm. In C, when you pass in a struct, you're passing in the whole struct. It <laughs> actually makes thing. a whole copy of it. That's cool. So this could be a performance problem if your struct is big. Can you create a pointer to the struct? Absolutely. And oh, I, we could pass in a what, pointer to the struct. <laughs> that's what you're going to do next. <laughs> Probably what I'm going to do next, yeah. In fact, why, don't, why don't we do that, right? So instead of passing in the whole Pokemon, which contains all those characters, right? So mm -hmm. when it passes in that struct, it's got to make a copy of all those strings. Mm -hmm. Now, the strings aren't that big, right? They're only 20 characters and 10 characters. But imagine it was much bigger. Mm -hmm. So we could pass in a pointer to a Pokemon. And then how do we change these? So now we're no longer being passed in a struct. We're being passed in a pointer to a struct. So we can't use the dot anymore. Dot Can you only use the little arrow? On. Yeah. It's the arrow, right? It's the arrow, uh huh. Let's just, and then anytime we call in, call print Pokemon, we can't pass in an actual Pokemon. We have to pass in a pointer to it. Let's just make sure it works. It does. Nice. Now, someone here suggested maybe making this a const up here. And that way, we tell the compiler that we don't intend to ever change the structure. We're just going to read it. That way, if um, in our print Pokemon, if we accidentally change the structure, then it will throw an error. So if in here, if I like attempt to go p hit point, uh, you know, times equals two, right, it doubles the hit points <laughs> surreptitiously, then it should, <laughs> it should then throw an error because we're attempting to change the struct. 
I'm curious to see, does that actually work? Yeah, right? We declare it to be const, and then we tried to change it. Gotcha. But I consider that to be kind of like a, a little side thing. Mm -hmm. The main point is we can pass in a pointer to the struct. And now we're not passing in the whole thing, we're just passing in the address of it. Just eight bytes to copy, rather than mm -hmm. 30 something. So then if we were gonna do that to an array, we would have to malloc the size of a structure, the size of a structure pointer. Like and if then, we're gonna make this other picture over here? Yeah. Yeah. We would malloc the size of a structure pointer and then add, make the array that size and then pass in the pointer to that array for each struct. Something like that. But we're, we're still working with this picture. Sorry, I'm here. getting, I know I'm getting ahead of myself. Right, this, is, this is ultimately <laughs> where we want to go, right? Yeah. Um, we might do that next time. Okay, so, so but what I wanted to do, uh, there's, there's two more things I wanted to do, and we've got uh, 25 minutes to do it. So there's two more things I wanted to do. One is make it so that we can have more than 10 Pokemon. And in fact, we could have an unknown number, and the array just expands itself. Ooh, right? <laughs> and the other is, this, this main is getting long, right? It's huge now. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> like, uh, you know, all, all, about 50 lines long or more, 60 lines long. And so I'd like to start splitting some of it apart. And maybe the first thing I can do is I could take this searching portion of it and we'll move that into its own, into its own function. So what I want the search to do is we pass it the array that we are searching through and the target Pokemon that we're trying to find. And then it gives us back the Pokemon that it found. Let's see, where should we put that? Should we put it at the top or the bottom? I do the top because I don't like to make... I always forget to do the, the, the prototype prototypes. headers. Yeah. I don't know. Let's... I'm gonna move it down here. So we're going to write a function called search. Search Pokemon. Po search Pokedex. We're going to be passed in the uh, target um, but instead of passing in the whole struct, Let's do a pointer. why don't we just pass in a pointer to it, right? So that we don't end up copying a whole lot of stuff. And we could make it const just so that we don't accidentally modify the values in it. And we're going to pass in the array of Pokemon. Now these look pretty similar here, right? They're both being passed in a Pokemon pointer. But in this case here, this is one single Pokemon that we're passing in as the target. And the second one over here is an array of Pokemon. And in fact, if you wanted to be like a little more clear about it, you could do this, but they're really the same thing. Mm -hmm. As of right now, though, the, it doesn't know the difference. It just knows yeah. that there's two pointers. There's just so two you pointers. Can really, okay. yeah. but, but visually, you can kind yeah. of illustrate that this one is a single Pokemon and this one over here is an array of Pokemon. But yeah. type-wise, they're both just pointers. Mm -hmm. So search Up to us to array remember. of Pokemon, given the target Pokemon to find 
and the array of Toki want to search through. We'll return the found Pokemon or no if we didn't find it. Oh, golly. We actually have to pass in one more thing. I was going to ask about the size. Yeah, we have to pass in the size. I didn't know if we could use... the Because the string length is just going to be for the specific one. Yeah, if we just say, what's the size of Dex? It's going to say, I don't know. Yeah. Because all it's passing in is just the address of it. Mm-hmm. All right, so given the target Pokemon to find, the array of Pokemon to search through, and the length of the array, return the found Pokemon or null. Okay, so we're going to return a Pokemon pointer. All right, so we don't have to pass back the whole struct. Okay, so basically the inside of this search is, is basically this thing here. So we're going to go from i, i is 0, up to length. If string compare, now target here is going to be t. t, but we're not going to do a string compare of an entire Pokemon. We want just the name. Can I do t.name? Yeah, because you're passing in a struct, pointer to a struct. Ah, I'm passing in a pointer. So oh, you got to do a got to arrow. Use the arrow. Yeah. And then here, this is Pokédex I. Now, do I use the dot or the arrow? You're still doing pointer, so it has to be the arrow. No. Now I'm passing. Oh no, because you're not using the IC. I'm passing in an array, right? Yep. And I'm yep. indexing into the array. So Pokédex bracket I is going to be a single Pokemon. And I'm going to use dot name here. So you really got to keep track of like what's being passed in and how are they being do accessed. We, do we need to change the name of that to Dex? Yes. Okay. And now we're not going to print anything out. We're just simply going to return the Pokemon that we found. Which, for starters, is dex bracket i, but we don't want to return the entire Pokemon. We just want to return a pointer to it. So the address of it. John says, now we know to be afraid if he pulls up a children's toy at the beginning of lecture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's recap here. So we got a function <laughs> called search Pokédex. You pass in a pointer to a Pokémon that you want to... Um, actually, no, no, no. You know what? I'm sorry. Let me back up. This, this should just be a string. This is just a string. Not a whole Pokemon, right? Because we're, we're, just, we're just prompting the user to type in name. the name of a, a Pokemon. We're not typing them to type in all the information about a Pokemon. So, yeah. so this should just be character pointer T, right? Okay. It's a good thing I kind of like walked through it <laughs> a second time, <laughs> right? So we're passing in, oops, the, given the, the, the name of a target Pokemon to find, I need to update my comments to reflect what we're doing here. So given the name of the, con the, the, name of the target Pokemon and an array of Pokemon called Dex and its length, we're going to search through the array comparing the 
the target name to the name of the ith Pokemon in the array. And if it's a match, return the address of that Pokemon. If we get all the way through the loop and we didn't find anything, we're going to return null. Uh, missing an E right there. Okay, now we'll come up to here and we'll call search Pokedex. We'll pass in the target that we're searching for, the, the address or the array of Pokemon that we're searching through, and how long it is. And we will get back a pointer to a Pokemon. And then we can check if found is true, which means we got a valid address back, got a valid pointer back, we're going to call print Pokemon with the Pokemon that we found. And remember, that's just a pointer, right? Else, printf, aw, <laughs> find it. Let's see, we got some errors. Oh, uh, the first thing was, and this maybe will fix a lot of this stuff here. Do what I did. All at the top. Whoosh. I always do that. Here's a handy little tip. Like this, this previous compilation produced all this output here and if I just do up arrow and then rerun the compile it's really hard to visually distinguish between the error messages on the mm -hmm. current compile and the error messages from the previous compile so what I do is I hit enter a few times then I run the compile and now it, visually you can you can see the separation oh I've them. been using clear that's way better I should hit enter more often all right, so we took all those errors and we got down to just one here, which is warning, returning const Pokemon pointer from a function with result type Pokemon pointer discards qualifiers. Okay, so I think what this is saying is that maybe this shouldn't be a const. <laughs> I think that's what that's saying. Yep. Yeah, that's what it said. Okay, find find one. So let's do Charizard again. And it found it. Great. And let's type in one that's not there. Oh, I didn't find it. Awesome. I like that. Okay, so, so what do we do there? We, we now separated out the search into its own function. And another thing that we could break out is like all, all this stuff. Malcolm says, I keep misspelling Charizard, <laughs> and it keeps bugging him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's, 
That's how much I know about Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to go fix it, right? <laughs> All right, where were we? Oh, so we're going to break out this, all this stuff with loading, loading the, the array. And we have nine minutes. Can we do it? Oh, I think we yeah. can. All right, so let's... So we're going to make a function called load Pokédex. We're going to pass in the name of the file... And it's going to return to us that array that contains all the Pokemon in it. And since we're just returning an array, it's just a pointer. John says, can we comment uh, some of these conditions? Check number of command line args. We got trim new line there. And then if found, I hope that's obvious what's happening here is, so if found is valid, mm -hmm. then that's why I like to sometimes name my variables so that they read more like English, but stilted English statements. Right. <clears throat> Compare target name with name from Pokédex. Okay. So, <clears throat> back to what we were doing. So we got a function called load pokedex, you pass in the name of the file, and it returns the array of Pokemon. So I'm still going to check the number of command line arguments in the main, but everything from basically line 25 down to 44 is going to go into that new function. All the way down through the closing of the file, right? Yep. So I just I just pasted that in. So in this case, now we got to go and uh, fix up what we did here. So we're not going to pass in, we're not going to get access to argv1, but this is going to become file name. You spelled file with an e in some of those places. File name without an e at the bottom too. Great. I gotta go find them all. Uh, the very, very name. bottom left one we did uh, didn't have an E. Now here we're just here's where we're gonna load Pokédex. There's a comment there. We're we're gonna put in the statement to actually load the Pokédex, but we'll come down and fix up this function. So file with an E, file with an E. This is file name here. Then we create our Pokédex, uh, read through the file, this looks okay, and then we close it, and then finally, return Pokémon Array, so we go return Pokédex. Uh-oh. Oh, so some of these problems are because I need to come up here and actually put in this line that loads the Pokédex. So, um, character pointer Pokédex. Pokédex equals load Pokédex. argv1. 
That's the name of the file. Okay, we, we got some problems here. Yeah, we got several problems. Incompatible pointer types assigning character pointer from Pokemon pointer. What happened there? Load Pokedex. Did I? That's right, character pointer file name. Returns a Pokemon pointer. Oh, this should be Pokemon right here. That's a problem. All right, that's better. That, that removed a whole bunch of errors there. Um, oh, use of undeclared dynafire count. Oh, okay. So we got a problem here. Load Pokedex has a variable called count in it, which <coughs> contains the number of actual Pokemon that we've read into the array. But it's not visible outside in main, where it's needed to be passed into search Pokedex. So how do we resolve that? You either throw on the pointer or you can malloc it. Well, we actually got a couple issues going on here. So I've been leading up to this all semester. <laughs> when you pass back an array out of a function, uh, you, can, you pass back the array itself, that's fine, but you also need to pass back the length of the array. We need to pass back two things, but we can only pass back one. So how do we get that second thing back to the caller? You use a pointer. You use a pointer. Yeah. So we essentially pass it in as a parameter, but it's empty to begin with, and then the function itself fills that in for us. So when we call load pokedex, we'll have int count here, and then we'll pass in the address of count, but so far it's an invalid value. It just contains garbage. And then where's our load pokedex? We'll pass in int pointer size, and then just before we return the Pokédex, we'll set the size. So we'll take the value of count and copy it into what size points to, and that'll fill in the value for us. So now when we compile this, we're just down to one warning. We got rid of all this stuff about count not being not being declared. All right, so this last warning here says the address of stack memory associated with the local variable Pokedex is being returned. Uh-oh. What does that mean in English? It means we need to allocate the memory for it. That means because it's that, on the stack and yeah, it disappears once the function is executed. a local exited. variable inside of load Pokedex and it doesn't exist outside. So instead of making a local variable, we need to make it a dynamically allocated variable, dynamically allocated array. So Pokemon pointer Pokedex equals malloc 10 times the size of a Pokemon. And that'll allocate space for 10 Pokemon structures and give us back a pointer to it. No errors when we compile. Oh, let's see if it works. Oh, so far so good. Found Charizard and did not find Onyx. So that's great. All right, so last little recap here. We took all 
the uh, lines of code that had to do with loading the Pokédex, opening the file, allocating the array, reading each line of the file, breaking it apart, we took that all and moved it into another function called load Pokédex. We pass in the name of the file that we're reading in, plus a, a pointer to an integer, which is going to be filled in by load Pokédex with the size of the array. And then we get back the actual array itself, or a pointer to it. And then the rest of the program is the same. Now, here's load Pokédex. It's declared to take in a file name, along with a pointer to an integer, which we're going to fill in. And we're going to return the pointer to the array of Pokémon. Open the file. We just have to change the parameter being passed to f open, along with the parameter being used in the error message. We can no longer allocate the array on the stack. We can't pass back a local array, so we have to use malloc instead. Here's our 10, which is the size of the array, and then each element of the array is a Pokemon, so we use size of Pokemon. And this will allocate a total of 10 times whatever the size of a Pokemon is. I think it's like 36, something like that. And then we just get back a pointer to that array. And then this part of the function is copied verbatim from the code that we had in main before. Close the file. And now, just before we return the array, we also fill in the size with the actual number of values that are in the array. So we allocated space for 10, but in our case, we only have, we only have actually seven Pokemon. So three of them are just empty. Garbage values. And then the rest of our main is the same as we had before. We just call load Pokedex. We can print it all out. We prompt the user for a Pokemon to find, trim off the new line, do a linear search by using search Pokedex, where we pass in the target name of the Pokemon, the entire Pokedex array, and how long it is. And then if we got back a Pokemon pointer, we print it out. If we didn't get anything back, we just say, oh, we didn't find it. So we can type in the name of any Pokemon that is in our Pokédex, and it finds it, and returns it, prints it out. Whew. So let's scroll through this from the top. And yes, the, um, some people are suggesting we can do things like move some of these functions or move some of these declarations into their own header files. And maybe we'll do that next time. We're kind of running out of time now. Um, but at the top, we have a declaration for a structure. Then our function prototypes. Main, check the number of command line arguments. Load the Pokédex. Print out the contents of the array. Then prompt the user to type in the name of a Pokemon to find. Trim off the new line. And then call search Pokedex. If we got a valid Pokemon back, then we call print Pokemon with the Pokemon that we found. Otherwise, we print out, ah, oh, didn't find it. OK, print Pokemon is simply take in a Pokemon pointer and print out the three fields. That's all it does. Search Pokédex takes in a target name, the array of Pokemon and its length, and then it just does a linear search on it. So it does a string compare against the name and the name of each Pokemon in the Pokédex. And when it finds one, it returns the address of that Pokemon. Otherwise, it returns a null.
And then finally, load Pokédex takes in the file name and the size to be filled in, opens the file for reading, allocates space for 10 Pokémon, reads in each line of the file, breaking it apart into the name, hit points, and type. Close the file, fill in the size, and then return the array. Okay, so for next time, there's a couple of features I want to add to this. One is, I actually want to turn it into this picture, where instead of having each element of the array being an entire struct, we have instead pointers to structs. Now, we don't have to do it like this. We could still keep it in this form up here. Uh, the reason why I might want to move it into this form is when I want to sort this array and start moving the Pokemon around so that they're sorted, let's say, in alphabetical order, then um, if I have the individual structs inside the array, that's a lot of stuff to be swapping around as I do my sort, as I, as I swap the elements of the array, because each one of these structs is fairly big. I mean, they're not huge. We don't have that many Pokemon, so it's not going to be a big deal. But if we have this picture here, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm leaving the structs where they are, and I'm just moving the pointers around. So it's less data to move around. So that, that could be a compelling reason to move it to this style. And another thing I want to do is make it so that if I have more than 10 Pokemon, that the array expands itself. And, you know, we could actually do that with this style here. We're going to use a technique very similar to what I showed you last week. Which was, as the Pokédex array fills up, we then use realloc to make it bigger. And then we can read in as many Pokémon as we, as we need. Can take this entire thing and put it in there. <laughs> so next time, we'll make that array expand itself. We'll see if we can convert it to the other style. Again, we don't have to, but it might be a good idea. And then we'll learn about um, sorting the array so that we can do a more efficient searching. And then that'll lead cool. us into the last part of our big password cracking assignment, which was how can we read in a large file of hashes to crack, read in a large file of potential dictionary words, and then search through that dictionary efficiently to find the, the hashes that we want to crack. So if you're thinking ahead, you probably got some idea about what this program is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sucrit, class is ending. Sorry. <laughs> I know. But uh, tune in on Wednesday, and we'll finish this up. That was a good We're going to do it tomorrow? Uh, Wednesday. No, I meant Thursday. Are, are you going to have class on Thursday? Yeah. Oh, okay, wait. Cool. Is, well, like, Thursday is Veterans Day, right? Yeah, it's a holiday. Do we, do we does, does our... School's does, closed. It has, okay, so maybe we'll have to do it next Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> So we're not keep, meeting on Thursday? Keep you in suspense. <laughs> John says, but our department still meets. <laughs> so. <laughs> huh. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to do it, I'd be down. I don't know if you're allowed to, but... Well, nothing's stopping me from doing it. Yeah. So, yeah, Thursday's an official holiday, huh? Yeah. yeah. For those of you who are watching who are not in the United States, it's Veterans Day. And it's one of the few holidays that are like in the middle of the week. I know. Instead of, instead of being pinned to one of the weekends like they usually yep. are. 
I was uh, uh, one of our nearby universities, Sacramento State. They do something weird with their holidays. They um, they don't observe the holidays during the school year. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know that. So what they do is they continue to have classes, and then they pack all the holidays in in the week between Christmas and New Year's. <laughs> so if you okay. look on their academic calendar, mm. there's no holidays in there except for Thanksgiving. I think they take Thanksgiving off. But then like uh, December 26th says like observing later Labor Day and December 27th says observing Veterans Day. <laughs> December 28th says observing Easter. You know, like, <laughs> and That's that way funny. that way they can have continuous classes and give people that week off mm -hmm. because that's when all the holidays are. Yeah. <laughs> what, what our college does is they just give people the week off. They say, yeah, but we'll, we'll pay you during that week. Mm -hmm. So you kind of get a free week off. But at Sac State... <laughs> nope. You get, well, you get, you get holiday pay, right? You get your holiday pays, but all on that week between Christmas and New Year's. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's see. Uh, John's saying he'll be here anyway on Thursday. I don't know. I'll figure out what to do. I mean, you, you know, we could we could finish up this Pokédex thing, and then on Tuesday actually talk about the assignment. You know, mm -hmm. we could do like finish up the Pokédex thing, and we could do debugging on 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 stuff, or we could do maybe a different example of arrays of structs, right? Just to show you kind of like. A different way to do things. We'll we'll figure it out. We'll see. I mean, my my kids will be home, so I might not be able to actually <laughs> do yeah. do anything. But we'll see. <clears throat> All right. Uh, anyway, so that's it. Cool. Good. We 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 made a lot of progress here. Yeah, that was fun. Cool. All right. Well, yeah. I'm gonna fix all my little syntax issues and make it run. Right. So hopefully. Um, Let's see, so it takes a while for Zoom to process the video, but the YouTube video is up pretty quick. Okay. So you'll be able to almost immediately after the stream ends, go back and watch the video from the beginning and find the spot where you scroll through the, the, um, the program and then just copy it in. Okay. Uh, John says this is his favorite lecture so far. Yeah, this was fun. Now we're really starting to put together all these pieces that we've been leading up to, right? We got files, structures, arrays, um, string functions, um, data structures, right? So right now it's just an array, but soon it's going to be a more complex data structure. Mm -hmm. So all these pieces are coming together. Yeah, it's super fun. All right. You can tell you don't really want to go, but I got to. <laughs> <laughs> all righty well i will see you either thursday or tuesday yep i'll send out a and note if I, all right either way. well if all i right. don't enjoy your weekend have a good holiday yeah, you too thanks right, bye-bye bye-bye all right so i just close out the i have to close out the sessions one at a time so the zoom session is is done. Now it's the YouTubers here. Where can I find the course syllabus? Um, I don't think it's really public. So people who are enrolled at my my college can get to it. So this is primarily a stream for them, but I'm making it available on YouTube because I had some students say that they can't watch the Zoom session where they are. They're in a, a rural community where they don't get really fast internet, and so the Zoom session is just too much bandwidth for them. So they wanted to watch a session where they could choose the quality and therefore choose the bandwidth. So I'm also simultaneously um, streaming it to YouTube um, so that people can watch it. And then, of course, now I've got people like you who are watching. And so this is good stuff. But this is a program, this is a course in C programming, actually called Systems Programming in C. So not only is it an introduction to C itself, but it's also a little bit about um, what makes C unique versus things like Java or Python, 
what are things what is C used for primarily these days it mean, C used to be a general purpose programming language it was used for everything but now we have other languages like Python and Java and, 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 and PHP that are used more for kind of like general purpose programming and C has become more of a specialized language for doing embedded systems, operating systems, really low-level stuff where you have to interface with the hardware. And so I focus more on that, learning about how to interact with the operating system, how to um, do things like networking. Um, when I do this course in person in a classroom, we do programming on little Arduinos, the little tiny program, uh, computers are about the size of a credit card, and we hook up things like lights and switches and, and, and motors to it. So a really kind of low-level stuff. Um, so that's, that's primarily where I go with, with this course, is teaching about the low-level stuff. So we do focus more on data structures and memory allocation, networking, and then also all the kind of tools that programmers use to help them be productive, like version control systems and uh, bug tracking systems. So I, I talk a little bit about that stuff as well. So it's, it's really a course for someone who's already taken an introduction to programming. So they've taken maybe one or two semesters of programming, and now they're ready to learn a new language and all the stuff that is used with that language. So what remains in the semester before we finish in early December, mid-December, somewhere in there, is... Um, we have, after we do this final password cracking set of programs, we've got networking. So we'll learn about how to send data to another process or another computer, how to get data back from it, how to, how to maybe exchange data back and forth. So not just send and receive once, but send and then receive, and kind of ping-ponging back and forth. Um, and so it remains to see exactly what we'll end up doing there. But. I have some ideas. Uh, this is not a master's degree course. This is a course for first and second year college students. That's what my college does. We just, we just do first and second year, and then the assumption is they'll transfer on to a four-year bachelor's institution and get their four-year degree. So if you're not from the United States, we have kind of a, um, I, don't, I don't know what the word is, it's just a, a non-conventional educational setup. So once you graduate from high school, which takes you up through 12th grade, you can either just stop there and then get a job with just a high school diploma, or you can go on to a university. And there's kind of two paths to do that. You can go to a standard four-year university and get your bachelor's degree, or you can start with what we call a junior college or a community college, get a uh, two-year degree or just the first two years of your bachelor's and then transfer over to a four-year institution and finish it up. So you kind of split it up. You can either go to a four-year institution right off the bat or you can go to a two-year institution and then take your remaining two years at that four-year institution. Now, the reason you want to do that is maybe the four-year institution is not near where you live and you'd rather kind of like live closer to home for your first two years, kind of ease your way into living independently. Um, and so you might do that. The other reason would be, there's a couple of reasons. One is community colleges or the two-year colleges tend to be cheaper than the four-year institutions. So you can save a lot of money if you take your first two years at a community college and then transfer over the four-year. And then also at the community colleges, the classes tend to be a lot smaller. So 20, 30 students per class versus a four-year institution where a lot of the classes are sometimes hundreds of students all packed into a room. And so if somebody wants a more personalized, one-on-one -on -one type experience, a community college is a good way to do it. So you get your bachelor's degree from the four years in institution, and then, of course, you could stop at that point, get a job, or you could go on and do graduate school, get either a master's or a PhD. You could either, at that point, stay at the same institution if they offer those advanced degrees, 
or the recommended thing actually is to transfer or go to a different institution. A lot of people like to see that, that you got your bachelor's at one institution and you got your advanced degree, a master's or a PhD, at a different institution. I think there's just um, maybe they want to see that you've got a, a good variety of educational backgrounds. If you just stick to one institution, then they might think, well, you're kind of siloed or shoehorned into one particular set of instructors. And so they like to see that you've maybe moved around a little bit. So you get your bachelor's at one institution and then your master's or PhD at another institution. Nice, that's how it's set up in the United States. I know it's different elsewhere. Anything else? Oh, thanks, angry programmer. You wanted to, you said that you saw your computer networking videos. Good. I, are you talking about like the DNS ones, which I never finished? There were, I only got to like halfway and then I just lost my steam on that. I did that. God, that was a long time ago. 10 years ago or, or more. And I remember at the very end of one of those videos, I said, and in the next videos, I'm going to show you this. And then I never did them. I still have that on my to-do list. Finish those videos, which probably means I have to start them all over again because I have a completely different setup as far as how I like write on the screen and interact with um, the, the cameras and stuff. And so it would look completely different. So I might as well just start all over again. Do I write GUI programs? Certainly not in C. Uh, writing GUI programs in C is like pulling teeth out. It's just, it's, um, I mean, you can. It's just that object-oriented languages are just much better at it. Because user interfaces tend to be object-oriented kind of um, just by default, right? You've got things like buttons and menus and windows. Those are all great for objects not so great for functions, where you don't have a hierarchy of functions. So I, I, you know, in Java, I do GUI programs, but not in C. It's just too much of a pain. <laughs> and I want to focus on the low-level stuff, interfa interfacing with the hardware. So I stick with command line, generally, for C programs. Anything else? It's, it's kind of difficult to have a conversation on YouTube because there's a 20 second delay between when I say something and when you see it, or when you hear it. So <laughs> I see the chat right away, but then there's a 20 second delay between when you hear the response to it. So it makes doing interactions a little difficult. I can reduce the latency, but then that potentially introduces more errors into the video and audio. So. Um, why don't we leave it at that? And so if you see a stream, uh, what, I don't know how it shows up on you, but like, um, you get a notification that a stream is going to start, but sometime in the future. So if you see that, then you know that I'm going to be doing something on Thursday when it's a holiday for us. If you don't see that and you get all the way up to 930 and you never saw that, it means we're not going to do it. So I think, um, I think we'll wrap it up here. Yeah, I like doing these Q and A's. So after the Zoom session ends, this is a great time to ask questions. <laughs> and I can just talk with you guys. All right, so like I said, we'll, we'll end it here. And then I'll be back tomorrow, that's Wednesday, with my other course, Discrete Structures. So if you want to tune into that, uh, we're talking about graphs and graph algorithms. We're going to be doing shortest path, I think. Like how do you get from point A to point B in the shortest way possible? We're going to be looking at that. Okay, 
Well, have a good day or a good night for some of you. It's always good to see all of you on here. We ended up with about 10 or 15 people, although a couple of them looked like they were spammers. So hopefully I got rid of those people. Have a good day, everyone. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.